soon, just to today. Yes, you. You gon' learn, you gon' learn, you gon' learn. It was just past one, win, two, three, man. With a four, five step to the door, like, oh my gosh, just throw that cash in a back bag. Run around the back and pull up the track, cause yo. Welcome to episode, hmm, no clue. 46, 45, around there. We're reaching our one year. Yeah, it's either 45 or 46. We are so excited because today we have one of my dear friends. I mean, Gina is, I mean, essentially you're like the most role model I could ask for in the healthy food blogging world. You guys, welcome Gina of Skinny Taste. Oh, thank you guys. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be on your show. We're so excited to have you. I mean, now we have three foodies. We've been doing more and more foodie-focused episodes So, versus just business. or you know, We have entrepreneurs on of all different worlds, but obviously it's always fun to have another foodie on. Yeah. So, Gina, why don't you start us off for anyone that might be listening who may not be familiar with you, which I don't believe is possible. Why don't you tell us your little elevator speech. Who is Gina and what is Skinny Taste? So I'm Gina Homolka, creator of Skinny Taste, which is a website, a blog that I started back in 2007 when I was trying to lose weight for my wedding. I went on to Weight Watchers, and like a lot of people that start a diet or Weight Watchers, you don't really know what to cook, right? You start this diet, and you're like, what are we doing? So um, I had gone online looking for recipes back then, and at the time, there was not a lot of recipes that... Um, were appealing to me. Everything was super processed. And, you know, I grew up with a very ethnic background. So I just didn't find anything that I thought, you know, was exciting. So <laughs> at that t- yeah, at that point, I always loved cooking. My parents always cooked everything at home. I've always cooked in the kitchen with them. And I decided, let me just start a blog. And it was something I did for fun and did not ever intend to make it a career. I did it on the side. I had a full-time job. Um, but it grew so fast. Two years later, I quit my job and made it full time. So now here we are. I've created four cookbooks. I am coming out with my fifth cookbook, the Skin Taste Meal Prep Cookbook, which hits shelves September 15th. And been such a crazy ride, but one that I don't take for granted. I love what I do every day. Yeah. And that rings true from everything you share and I feel like you know I I've met Gina in person many times you guys and you know how like you might have someone as a fantasy and then you meet him in real life but and it's like wah wah but you are literally the most positive like despite your success and everything that you've accomplished I feel like you are so down to earth and real and authentic and everything that you are online comes through in person which I think is just so incredible. Thank you. I really appreciate that. I mean, I don't think uh, success should change you, right? I love helping people. And this is really what I've always been doing is helping people. So I really appreciate that, Liz. That's cool. I love that. Okay, so let's talk about, first of all, when you when you first started off and you started to, you know, a couple years went by, you were able to quit your day job. How did you first start? Uh, was it when you were monetizing your blog, was it predominantly through ad revenue or did you start doing some sponsored work right away? What were some of the first few things that you did to make, you know, your hobby blog into an actual business? Right. Well, actually, when I first started a blog and I did a lot of research, like what is a blog? I did it on blogger.com, which was free. I really didn't know anything. So I Googled basically everything I needed to know, little HTML things, you know, so I figured it out on my own. And I did know that you could put AdSense on your site. So that's how I started. I just put some AdSense on there. I know that, you know, you need a lot of traffic to actually make money with that. Um, And as time passed, I remember I was like three months into it. I was at the gym with my friends and I was like so excited because I made $40 in, (laughs) I think in four months or something. And my friends were like, why are you doing this? Uh Um, but, you know, it was never about the money. I loved doing what I was doing. And it was like, I was like happy to make $40 in four months. I still had a job. Like, this was like just a passion. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, with time, the blog just grew and the traffic increased. And then I was able to get on with larger ad networks um, once you made over a certain amount of page views. And then I just had some real ads on there. And, of course, that's where most of my ad revenue, my revenue has always come from because I didn't start doing sponsored work until much later. And I don't even do a lot of it. I 
try to keep that to a minimum, maybe two spawn, three sponsor posts per month tops. Yeah, that makes sense. And I love how you do kind of unique sponsor work. Like for like right now, if you guys have stony filled yogurt in your refrigerators, you open the lid of the quartz, you're going to see a recipe from Gina. Yes. Of the yogurt, which, you know, I think, you know, Stony Phil was my first client in 2013. So I love seeing you guys working together and that's just to me. Such a me cool. too. <laughs> and, you know, actually I made that connection through you at, through yes, yes. Um, your retreat that you had in Michigan. And yes. that's how I actually made the connection. So thank you to you. Um, and I really only work with brands that I love that I use in my kitchen. So Stony Field is organic. I went on a farm tour with them. I loved them. And it just, it's, it's like a great fit. Right. Absolutely. And that's just another example, you guys, of why I'm so passionate about hosting blogger retreats. I've hosted five of them now because it's such a value to connect like-minded brands and bloggers, especially to have that chance for a face-to-face connection. You just never know what might come out of it. Uh, so I'm I'm really happy that that all like came back. That was tied down to a retreat, which I, I'm always a huge fan and encouraging people to, regardless of what industry you're in. I just think it's good to bring people together uh, when you can. So it's a true. You learn so much from those retreats, and when you go to the bigger conferences, sometimes they can be overwhelming or intimidating to meet someone. You have only 10 or 15 people in a group. It's just easier to make a connection, and you leave feeling so inspired. They're they're always my favorite. Yeah, me too. I have too. a question. How did you come up with the name? Skinny Taste. Way, way back, I was like, "How? what should I call this so that you could understand that the recipes are healthy and light? <laughs> and played around with a lot of things. And at the time, I guess it was GoDaddy. I was putting different names in to see what domains were available. And, and like I was like Skinny Palette or Light Taste. Or, and that was <laughs> available. And so it just, I was like, I think you get the name that the the recipes are light and healthy yeah. and tasty. So, I mean, I definitely, I feel like us seasoned bloggers are lucky that we started early and we had so many more um, options. I feel like if you're starting now, you're basically out of every name that could be out there. So, <laughs> that is, Especially now that people have like multiple blogs. And, exactly. Uh, what is something that you're... I, don't, I mean, it's like they're literal readers of your physical books, you know, consumers of your online recipes, your social media followers. What is something that your fans would be surprised to know about you? Something that my fans would be surprised. You know, I don't, I pretty much put everything out there. You know, one thing that they always are surprised, I don't like public speaking. Mm-hmm. I get very nervous when I have to do television. And when I like what you know you seem so confident you seem like you never seem nervous but I get nervous every time I have to do the today show coming in September oh, cool. I think I'm doing it for my kitchen <laughs> oh, so cool. like I always get nervous some people are like so comfortable with it so yeah. that's probably something that people don't expect yeah that makes total sense I mean I like that yeah so what's this past year been like for you I mean obviously you you know a lot of the things you're doing this year are things you've done before like you're writing this is your fifth cookbook right Yep. Uh, obviously, you're still creating new recipes for your website. So how did, just as like a, a, you know, a real, you know, you're a wife, a mom, a business owner, you know, like so many of us and others listening, how did the last year change things up for you and how did the pandemic impact you either personally, professionally, or both? Yeah, so it's been quite the year, right? 2020. <laughs> still in the process of writing this cookbook through the book, through the process, through 2020, we had only photographed half the book it has to hit the printer by a certain time for it to go you know be out on the date that like september 15th so there's a lot of scrambling a lot of people working from home we were trying to just figure it out and work wise that was a little bit of a challenge um luckily the photographer was able to shoot from her studio in california she would text me pictures to get approval. Right. I used Aubrey, Aubrey Pick, who was amazing. She's an amazing, talented photographer. So that was work. That was a little stressful with work. Of course, it impacted my life because my daughter had to, you know, work school, homeschool. I've never in my life <laughs> wanted to homeschool my kids because I don't think I'm good at it. <laughs> what grade is she in now? She's going into sixth grade this year. Okay. And so, of course, when this when they said it was only going to be for two weeks, I said, okay, two weeks, we can handle that. Right. 
But then it was like, I never went back to school. So that was a challenge, working at home, with her home. I live in New York, so New York was the hardest hit city at the time, or state at the time, with the highest amount of cases. So we were also extremely scared, really nervous. I didn't even leave my house, didn't want to go food shopping. I, it was impossible to buy food online because everything was taken, every time slot was taken. So that was a challenge and, you know, very stressful. But also there was something really nice about being home and having time with the family and I, you know, not having such a booked schedule. I feel like you're always busy. Somebody's always got something that they want you to do. So I had like a blank calendar and it felt so great not having to do anything and just gave me more time to just cook for fun and cook through my cookbooks. I have so many cookbooks on my shelf and I never actually get to use them. So I feel like we slowed down. We really enjoyed, you know, trying new recipes. I had a dim sum book that I've always wanted to uh-huh. use. Made a, you know, dumpling night a few times because we couldn't go after that. Chinese. Yeah. Then I got some sourdough starter and I was baking sourdough bread. How fun. Like I was, I'm not a baker. I, I, I love cooking, but baking it was never my forte. So that was really fun. So I think that is something we all enjoy doing together. And I am grateful that I have um, a house on the water. It has a beautiful view. So, and I have a lot of space. So I didn't really feel confined. And I know for people that live in the city and apartments, it's got to be really challenging. But I had some outdoor space. And I just found it, I didn't mind so much being home. I, I didn't, you know, I mean, I did miss seeing my friends and my family. But I didn't feel terribly upset about being home. I just really had to keep the news off because that was stressing me out. Once I stopped watching the news, I felt much better. The anxiety before that was just killing me. I imagine, especially being from New York. Yeah, it was crazy. And, you know, you watch the news and it was awful. I was like so anxious. So I said, I'm, that's it. I'm not watching the news anymore. Once I stopped watching it, I was like, okay, I'm actually feeling okay. So... <laughs> Are you normally a, a positive person, like an optimist? Yes. And if I ever have my days that I'm realizing that I'm not feeling good, because everyone has those moments, I have like a whole journal of things I've written in the past that get me out of a funk, because oh. I don't want to feel in a funk. So I listen to podcasts that are inspiring, or TED Talks, or start my day journaling, I love starting my day with gratitude. So I really, sometimes it's natural, and then sometimes I put the effort to be positive. Yeah, that's so smart. I think I love listening to podcasts as well because it keeps my mind occupied so that the other side of the brain that might subconsciously just, like, flow into, like, nervous or anxious is too preoccupied trying to consume the content of the podcast. So it's good. It keeps me focused on something else. Because I think sometimes... You just, like, your mind can just wander. Like you said, it's everywhere. You go on Facebook, you go, you know, you scroll anywhere. You're going to see. It's like I'll forget about how awful things are going. Then I go on Facebook, and it's just, like, everybody putting out negative news. And it's like, I, you got to kind of control I completely agree with you. And that was another thing. I tried to go on Facebook less. It's funny how, like, different social media Uh had different vibes. But I started (laughs) TikToking that... I started my TikTok in, through the through COVID because I had nothing but time. And for the longest time, I knew everyone kept saying, you know, for brands, like, it's really good yeah. to be on TikTok. It's, but every time I would look at them, I'm like, I don't have time to figure this out. But I had nothing but time. And TikTok <laughs> is so fun and inspiring. And I was like, wait, this is not just kids dancing. So yeah. I really learned TikTok. And I had a mission to, like, grow my TikTok, which I think I'm um, at like 90,000 followers, which is like a lot in a few months. It's crazy. Yeah, Yeah, that's a lot. So it's fun, though. It's creative. I feel like when you're creative, you're also not giving yourself time to worry because you're too busy focusing on, like, what should I do or what should I cook? So that was a huge help. Yeah. Definitely stayed away from Facebook, though. And Instagram (laughs) I still love. So, you know, Instagram is definitely a place that I've always enjoyed. Have you uh, dipped your toes into Instagram Reels? Yes, because I feel like everyone's saying you have to be there, but I don't think it's as good as TikTok. So when I do Reels, I'm basically just uploading a 15-second video that I've done on TikTok, mm-hmm. and I just upload it to Reels. And it does really well, but yeah. I don't create the whole thing in, in their program. Okay. 
So I don't know how it's going to be. Have you been using it? I've been using it a little bit. I, I had, I mean, my one video recently did really well compared to all the other ones. And it's, it was nothing special. I was making a cocktail and just put all the parts to it and then some music in the background. And I was yeah. like, okay. So I, it's one of those things where it's, you know, we can't do all the things all the time. So I don't yep. put a lot of pressure on myself for, for like the reels and TikTok, the thing, like even like I use LinkedIn, but I don't get mad at myself if I forget for a couple of days. So I, I just try to do those things when I can, because so many other aspects of our role is so regimented and scheduled. So it's like, if the mood strikes me, I'll do it, but I don't beat myself up. if like, I forget for a few days. <laughs> That's the best advice. And again, I mean, to, they say to grow on TikTok post three times a, a day. Like I don't do that. I don't have time and I don't post every day. So. Yeah. And so, and the same thing with reels, if I do it, I do it. If I don't, you can't do everything. You can't do everything. No. It's a wonder I do a podcast once a week. <laughs> yeah, but you, you're enjoying it, so you're doing what you love. And I think when you do what you love, it shows. And that's basically what you know, like how I feel like I have to live. A lot of people are always surprised that I do my own social media. I do my own Facebook. I don't right. hire people to do it for me. But I actually enjoy it. So it never feels like a chore. I hate I answering my emails. That. I love that you do that. And you have such strong channels and I feel like when you outsource, it's like you hope it's like 80% as good as how you would do it. Like that's like you always hear like if someone can do it 80%, right. 90%, like don't ever expect it. So I think like there's no, if you enjoy doing it, there's no substitution to you, to your voice. It's exactly. You. So. Exactly. People when you do it yourself, you can also really know your audience because you see the feedback and you're reading the comments and you're answering the comments. And if someone else is doing that for you, you I think there's a little bit that you're losing touch with your audience. A hundred percent. Right. Yeah. Well, I have a question. What do you think was the reason why you grew so, got so big? Like, what was it? Are you talking about TikTok or the blog? Oh, the blog. The blog. When I first started the blog, there weren't a lot of bloggers doing Weight Watcher recipes, and at the time I was, I was focused on Weight Watchers because that's what I was doing. And so there was a Weight Watcher, like there was no social media. I don't even <laughs> think, yeah, there was no social media yet. So Weight Watchers had community groups, and they would just talk about what they were cooking, what they were eating, and everyone kept talking about my site. So I got a lot of traffic from the Weight Watcher community at first, and I didn't really, I was getting a lot of traffic just from search, even though I didn't really know what I was doing with search. I wasn't, I didn't know anything about search engine optimization, but I wasn't very creative in my headlines. I would just call the recipe what it was, so people found it. So I think that was it. It was just also being one of the first ones to do it. I started uh -huh. early. So my recipe collection is in the thousands uh, just because I've been doing it for so long. Exactly. You know, you're now in your, I think you're, you're, you're 13 because I'm your 10. I started in 2010. As you've grown, and obviously you have a family, you, I know you value fitness and time for yourself and cooking. So I'm assuming in time you did have to outsource some tasks would you mind sharing perhaps some of the tasks within your business that you have outsourced and how you decided on which to outsource? Yeah, sure. Well, like the calculation of the points on the recipes and the nutritional macros, I outsource that. I definitely check on it. They send me a screenshot of all the ingredients just to make sure there's no error. You know, there's no reason why I have to spend the time doing that. Right. Um, all of the videos that I have on Facebook, I, at first I learned how to make videos and I was doing them myself and then I, and then I realized this is a lot of work. This is not fun. <laughs> Why am I doing this? So I, I outsourced those. And then I have my aunt works with me in oh, the kitchen. Cool. So she helps me in the kitchen. She helps me prep. She helps me clean dishes. If I want to test a recipe, she will, you know, bring me all the ingredients. If I want to cook from one of my cookbooks because I'm promoting, you know, maybe I'm doing an Instagram story, I'll have her send me all the ingredients prepped. So she definitely helps me, and that's a set of hands that that I love having because it's really hard to do it all. Mm -hmm. um, and she also gives me feedback. So we, you know, if I'm testing a recipe, I'll get her feedback. She has... Um, she she can't have gluten or dairy, so it also has expanded me to understand what she can eat, how to make something gluten free, dairy free, because so that we could eat it together. So it's helped my audience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. 
Who else do I outsource to? I'm trying to think. Um, do you work with an agency for brand partnerships? Or oh, you- yes. I work oh. with DBA. They mm-hmm. do my brand partnerships. And I love that because I hate reading contracts. And <laughs> <laughs> that, so that's great. I, that's like one thing that I don't even have to think about. They do all the back end work and then, then just tell me, okay, this is the date you're going to, you know, this yeah. is your time slot. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So. That's, That's nice because that I I do find that that definitely does take up a lot of time. So it, and if that's something you really love or enjoy, like that's such a great thing to outsource. And you know they're probably the experts. That like I always tell you, like we're not lawyers, we're not this, we're not that. You know, it's like we can't necessarily yeah. claim to be experts on all. It's a things. lot to know exactly to look at those contracts and what are you reading and what are you. What am I signing? So yeah. it definitely helps. Yes. And of course, I have a cookbook agent. I have a literary agent, Janice Sanad, who's amazing. So she also handles a lot of the contracts when I work with DBA. But she also does all my contracts and negotiating with all my books. That's awesome. Okay. So speaking of books, why don't you tell us a bit about your fifth I keep calling him your baby, but uh-huh. I don't know what you My call fifth it. child. <laughs> your fifth <laughs> child, exactly. Tell us about how you came up with it and everything. Tell, like, someone, why should someone get this book? Skate Taste Meal Prep, this cookbook, I actually polled my audience when I was coming up with a concept for my fifth book. My publisher asked me, you know, what do you want your next book to be? And they said, let me pull the audience and see what they want. So they came back with tons of ideas and the top three ideas were meal prep, freezer recipes, and make ahead recipes. So I basically took all three of those concepts and turned them into this one book because they all really work hand in hand. And um, so what I love about this book is it's really for the fans, like it's what they're asking for. And, um, you know, there's definitely a need for meal prep. People are so busy, their schedules, they have kids in school. Now everyone's going back to work. Or even if you're working from home and you're cooking more, just having all your meals prepped in advance. Not all your meals, but having some things prepped in advance uh, is so helpful so you don't go hangry on those nights that you don't (laughs) have anything ready and wind up, you know, making bad choices and, and, you know, or ordering takeout and spending more money than you'd like, you know, more than fits your budget. So it is really helpful. And I think it's been really fun to work on this book. I had to test all my recipes to see, you know, if they were freezer friendly, how long they would last in the refrigerator, how would they do on the fourth day or fifth day in the refrigerator, how to reheat them from frozen. So it's been like a test kitchen, a skin taste test kitchen in my house, you know, making this book. But it's been fun and I learned so much in the process. Yeah, I think that's going to solve a huge need for so many people. And I feel like with it being a, a pandemic year that I think in the beginning, you know, when it was like the lockdowns came in, we were home all day, like making cocktails on a Monday, like <laughs> baking cookies and bread all day. And, then, and I feel like after on like week six, I just noticed there was, a, I noticed like as a healthy food blogger myself, there was just a real demand for nutritious recipes again. And I think that yeah. just, especially during a pandemic, there's never been a better time or a more important time to take care of your health and yeah. obviously food and what you eat is is probably the you know, it's sure more fun than working out <laughs> so and I we always say health is 80 percent in the kitchen you know weight loss is 80 percent in the kitchen so I feel like now more than ever regardless of whether you're going into an office or your kids are at school everyone needs to fuel their bodies with nutritious foods right now I mean, we're heading into cold and flu. My husband got a yep. flu shot yesterday. I was like, oh, my God, here we go. I know. I'm not so, ready for it. <laughs> so I just think that that's super relevant to your point, even if you aren't leaving the house. I mean, I've like you, we've worked from home for years, and I've still meal prepped because I still have to eat lunch, and I don't necessarily want to cook every meal that I'm consuming, and I'm not going out to eat. So right. I, I'm so excited to cook for your book. Oh, thank you. Yeah, and, you know, there's not one way to meal prep. A lot of people love prepping all their lunches for the week and maybe all their meals on a Sunday for the week. And then for some people, that's extremely intimidating and overwhelming, and they don't know where to start. So I always say, like, you don't have to do everything on a Sunday or, you know, on your day off. You can just simply double up on what you're cooking and freeze your other half, make oh, yeah. soup, freeze the other portion. And 
you know, maybe in a few weeks or a month later, you can pull it out of the freezer and reheat it. You're going to be so happy on that night that you realize that you have oh, yeah. you know, bolognese sauce in your freezer. Or often I also like to double up, like if I'm making a roasted chicken. It's mm-hmm. just as easy to roast two chickens as it is to do one. And then the second chicken I'll use for, so I have a chapter in my book called Planned Overs, that they're not actually <laughs> leftovers because people find leftovers boring, of but course. these are planned overs that you're actually planning on planning on using them in a different recipe. So whether you use it oh, in smart. a chip like in a wrap or if you use it in a salad or in enchiladas, it's gonna be a completely different recipe and you're not gonna get bored of it. Yeah. Cook once, eat two or three times. That exactly. Is, I even just like I'll like I always find like when I'm shredding a cabbage I can never eat a whole shredded cabbage, obviously, at once, so I'll shred the whole thing, and then I'll use the cabbage in soups, in salads, in wraps, like, it, to your point, in, in all yes. different ways. And like you said, meal prep does not have to be that whole island of your kitchen with, like, Tupperwares for, like, the next five years. <laughs> exactly. And those people that do that, I mean, those are my heroes. Oh, yeah. They, that is, like, I, I. it's great that they do it, and that's great if that is the way you yeah. like to cook. I don't yeah. think there's a right or a wrong. Everybody's life and situation is different. So you have to do what's right for you. Yeah. But I some people there's some funny memes about it where it's like <laughs> there's like two thousand containers and it's because I think to your point, people get intimidated. So people will be like, yes. I'm afraid of meal prep and you think you have to spend twelve hours in Sunday on your kitchen. It doesn't right. have to be that way. Yeah, who wants to waste a whole Sunday doing that? I mean Another thing is I always tell people just to start small, like pick two recipes for the week, like plan on two things you want to maybe cook that you want to have for lunch or breakfast and start there. If you're not sure if you're in a food rut, it's really great to, you know, reference food blogs, cookbooks. There's so many, like there's so much material out there, especially with your site, my site, where they can just get that inspiration for free and then just Make a shopping list, you know, write down what your plan is so that when you go to the supermarket, you're not buying everything and then you wind up having too much food and then you have a lot of waste. So when you plan, then you save a lot of money because you're planning ahead. Mm -hmm. A hundred percent. Exactly. And I think the other glory about recipes like yours and mine is that you can make substitutions of what you have on hand. They're not so strict that if you don't have everything, you can't make it. So I feel like so many of your recipes, if you don't have chicken, you could use pork. If you don't have ground beef, you could use ground turkey, whatever it might be. And I think in, in general, I just want, I know you feel the same way. I just want to empower people to feel yes. excited that they can do this and it, it doesn't need to be perfect. No, it's funny you say that because when I was cooking through COVID, I was sharing on Instagram stories. For me, it was, it felt good to do that. I know some people stayed off social media, but for me, it felt good to like just cook through Share whatever I was cooking. I just, mm-hmm. I liked helping other people, inspiring, and it got my mind off of stress. Right. Um, so that was one thing that was happening often. I was, I didn't have all the ingredients in my refrigerator, and I couldn't go out and get them. Um, so I was doing substitutions, and people were like, oh, I'm so glad you're showing me this. You know, right. like, I would have never thought of that. I'm like, yes, you don't have to follow the recipe. <laughs> you don't like cilantro, use parsley. Like, you don't have right. to follow it. So I know people like you and I, we so rarely follow recipes. So we sometimes assume everyone knows that you can swap things out all the time. <laughs> it's so true. But, I don't know how to follow a recipe. That's why I'm not a good baker. <laughs> Cause I always change everything. So I, yeah, same. I really, <laughs> go ahead. Yeah, I know not, you're, I know yeah. you're just like me. That's yeah, not just being foreign though, too. I don't feel like anyone uses a recipe. We all cook. Like, right. you know, so like baking, like everyone that I know that actually is a good cook probably really sucks at baking because yes. <laughs> don't have the patience to like measure out butter, rather not. Right. Weigh your flour. Yeah. All that <laughs> stuff. Rather just like, no, this looks good. Yeah. We add this. Yep. This is how you do it. Yeah. So, Maybe I'm going to add a pinch of this. Let's see what happens if I do that. Right. You can't, When you do that with bacon, you're like, oh, what happened? Oh, yeah. Or sometimes you get lucky and it works out, you know, but it's, for me, it's always like, let's see what happens if I keep the butter out, you know. So. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I think it's good for people to lean. Like Vince and I are very passionate because we don't cook from recipes like you. I'm just encouraging people to use their senses. So like taste things, you know, feel how's the texture feel like. I was making baked kibbe the other night, and I could tell 
based on like how much wheat I had added that I needed more onion, but that was literally by the feel of my hands with like the wheat and the, my, the meat and my, and, like sometimes you just got to get in there and like use your senses yeah, yeah. and trust your, your gut of, versus like measuring or, well, the recipe didn't say this, so I can't do this. I just think everyone will be much happier if they empower themselves. If you, if you want it spicier, add more chili spice. <laughs> exactly. Taste it, taste as you go. Salt as you go, season as you go. And, of course, if you make something several times, like I'm sure you make Phoebe a lot, yeah. um, you definitely know what it looks like by eye. When I first started cooking and I would ask my mom, Mom, how do you make this? And she would say, well, you got to throw in, you know, I don't know, this much. You have to throw in some chicken. I'm like, how much? Well, you know, just eye it. I'm like, well, what does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> in her eyes, I'm like, I can't see what you're saying. Like, my mother could never share me a recipe with me without, you know, with measurements. She's like, yeah, just eyeball it. Yeah. But I think that's what happens when you are, you're used to making the same thing, you know, something that you make all, all the time. Yeah, I agree. And, th- and if any of you guys listening want more basic cooking just tips to become a better cook. Vince and I did a whole episode called 10 tips for being a better cook. Cause this is reminding me of one of them is just to spend time cooking with other people. Cause I mean, I could ask Vince, Vince will never tell me a recipe ever. Cause he doesn't measure things. Like he doesn't know what he's making. Yeah, no. <laughs> so, right. The only way I've learned, the reason I've learned so much from Vince's cooking is cause we'll cook together. So Anytime like you, if you have family members or even just let your kids in the kitchen around you, there's hundred percent. That's just the only way that people are going to learn, you know, and this is coming from two people that write recipes for a living. (laughs) Yeah. But we want to really empower people just to, to not feel so chained to those and just get in the kitchen, have fun, cook with people that grew up cooking maybe different foods than you did. I'm actually cooking with a girlfriend in a couple of weeks and she's just going to watch me cook and learn that way. I just think that's such a good way to, to help people. Yeah, a hundred percent. I, I mean, I have some friends that they're different nationalities and I love going to their house and watching them cook and I'm just watching. I'm not even, they're not telling me anything. I'm just like, Oh, that's how you do that. So good. Oh, and I learned so much just from watching them. I'm like, Oh, that's interesting. You know? And it's funny because they're like, you're going to take my recipe, <laughs> but you just learn because people do things different ways and it's just mm-hmm. interesting to see different techniques and you know, you just don't, aren't born no- or knowing how to make something. You have to learn it from someone. So yeah. it's fun. And especially if you surround yourself with different ethnic groups, different people like, the, you know, just different tastes in the home. I love cooking, watching grandmas or home cooks have been, you know, making something for a long time. I love seeing even like videos of like people, like it's old Italian men cooking something. It's so like, I just love it because I just love how of course, they're never measuring anything, but you just yeah. love watching and seeing how they're cooking something. So, lots of inspiration out there. Can't mess it up. Taste it. No. Add salt if you want. The end. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> more garlic, more salt. You'll be good. One more lemon. Shifting gears a little bit. So, you're 13 years in. This is your fifth cookbook. What is some of your, like, DNA? What is some of your, like, tips to success? staying positive, your outlooks on life. For the people who are listening, what are some of your kind of like rules that you live by? Ooh, rules that I live by. I keep little positive reminders to myself in front of my desk. If I see a quote that inspires me or maybe I need to work on that, I'll put it right there up on my bulletin board so I see it when I need it. And I'm like, oh yeah, you like I need to not stress about this. Or, so I think definitely finding inspiration and having it front and center so you are reminded every day. I love setting my intentions. I, I always like to set my week with intentions. And that will set the tone for your whole week, whether it's work out more or be positive or inspire someone. That's something I've always loved doing. Sometimes I just write that in a journal. Sometimes I write it on a piece of paper. But writing it down, it just makes your whole week different. The minute you say, I'm going to be positive this week or I'm going to drink more water and exercise and do 10,000 steps a day, then and you keep seeing that piece of paper that whole week, you're more inclined to do it. So those are my tips for success. For me, it's just really putting everything out there to remind myself that I need to be inspirational or to be inspired by something or to, I have to remind myself. Yeah, that's perfect. 
Okay, who are what are maybe three of your favorite Instagram accounts to follow that inspire you? Because you know, there's enough things out there that we don't want to be consuming more of. So, what are some accounts that you love to follow that just keep you positive and focused? I love Brendan Bouchard. Mm -hmm. I think you follow him. I love him too. He's amazing. He's super inspiring. I know I I followed Jay Shetty. I just started following him on Instagram. Oh yeah. He's also super inspiring. And, you know, Shalene Johnson is really funny, and I follow her. She's funny. She's inspirational in so many ways, whether it's business, exercise, or just helping others. So I love following her as well. I love that. Well, guys, we're going to wrap this up now. Where can everybody, first of all, where and when can everyone get your book? Would we be able to put a link into the show notes of this podcast by chance? Sure. So the cookbook is now available for pre-order, and it hits shelves September 15th. It's on Amazon, Target, Barnes & Nobles, Indie Books. Basically, anywhere books are sold, it will be there. I, Costco. Is so we will make it. that uh, pre-order link in this episode so you guys can grab it. Because I feel like this is just the perfect, if you can't see a friend for a birthday or if you can't see someone for the upcoming holidays, no one is going to be upset to get a Skinny Taste cookbook from a friend. So Definitely the- not. And where can we follow you on social media? So at Skinny Taste on Instagram. It's Skinny Taste on Facebook and at Skinny Taste on TikTok. <laughs> you got to follow me on TikTok. TikTok's fun. Oh, I do a lot of recipes that I don't post anywhere else. The beauty about TikTok also is that the recipes don't disappear after 24 hours. That's a really good point. And those, I kind of love those uncurated, like, you know, maybe you're just making dinner or it's not like so perfect, like some of the more produced videos. That's what I love about it. It's not perfect. It's just my hands moving. It's not perfect lighting. It's not perfect setting, but it feels real and you add some music to it. It's fun. It's only 30 to 60 seconds long. Which is perfect. Well, if you enjoyed this episode, we would love it. Well, first of all, you all need to be subscribing to this podcast. So many people ask when different episodes come out. Just subscribe so that you get the little notification when they come out because we have some really exciting episodes coming up. I know you know, I'm sure, Gina, we have Bjork coming on soon from the Food Blogger Pro. I love him. He's great. Uh, and you guys, yeah, and his podcast as well is incredible. So Love his podcast, yes. So, so we have a lot of great episodes coming up. If there's anyone else you would like us to have on, Vince and I are always open to suggestions. Anyone that of any industry, you know, we've been going a little bit more in the food world lately, but we love talking with entrepreneurs from different industries because I think we all learn so much from people that aren't necessarily in the same niche as we are. So please, if you enjoyed this episode, send it to a friend. I know so many of you, I just know so many who are going to love this episode because Gina, you have so many loyal fans and followers for 13 years now. So if you are listening, text this to a friend who might enjoy, feel free to, if you're listening, tag Gina or myself or Vince or Ari Lemon on Insta stories. We just want to see who's listening, what you think. We want all of your feedback so we can make this podcast as good as possible. Yes. Vince, any closing words before you get back to that soup? <laughs> uh, I've been munching on it this whole time. Uh, but, Gina, thank you for coming on. I appreciate you making time for us. I'm excited to, like, go through your book, even though I don't really d- use recipe books. I've, I've seen some things in here that seem, like, pretty cool to make. So. Awesome. Well, thank you guys for having me on your show. Yeah, thank you so much, Gina. And good luck with the cookbook, and we'll be talking soon. Sounds good. Bye, Bye. guys. Bye, right, bye-bye. Some jazz yesterday, Drew.